numbers. And then when I got the audition for Yellowstone, I figured I was maybe number three on the list. And I went in and I read it, and uh, I heard somebody say, yep, that's it. The person that said, yep, that's it, when I left the office, I found out later that it was Taylor Sheridan. But he wasn't in the office. He was watching it on Skype in Utah. <laughs> Today in our lineup, to start out, we have one of the most popular and busiest stunt men and stunt coordinators in Hollywood. He comes from a line of famous stunt people because his dad was the famous Richard Farnsworth from the Gray Fox. And I'm talking about Diamond Farnsworth. Diamond, come on, right here. You've seen JAG, you've seen NCIS, and he is the man responsible for all of the action in those shows, plus doubling Sylvester Stallone in the very first Rambo film, First Blood. We'll be hearing all about it later. And he worked with one of my favorite directors, Walter Hill, a couple of times. So next we have Mr. Rudy Ramos. You know Rudy from High Chaparral and Yellowstone. Good to see you, Rudy. Pick a seat anywhere you want, pal. Okay. And next we have a man who made his film debut in a movie about Wyatt Earp. One of the best movies about Wyatt Earp. It's really the sequel to The Gunfight at the O.K. Corral with the same director, John Sturges, who did Gunfight at the O.K. Corral. I'm talking about the sequel with Jim Garner as Wyatt and his Doc Holliday, Jason Robards. Hour of the Gun, and it's the time now for the Hour of Monty Markham, right here. Yeah. All right, and we have some other people that uh, I don't see that are here. We could leave a space for them, or I could drag some unwilling celebrity out of the audience if uh, somebody would like to come and do that. Oh, no, wait a minute, Darby Hinton, he's supposed to be up here, too. I am? Yeah, come on, Darby Hinton. You know him as little Israel Boone on Daniel Boone. He doesn't fit in that outfit anymore, though. Pal. I have done one or two things since then. Okay, and we'll be talking about him. Have a seat right here. First, I want to start at that far end with Diamond Farnsworth. Diamond, your dad was just, not just one of the best stuntmen around, but then he evolved into a two-time Academy Award-winning actor. When you were growing up, yeah, let's hear it for Dick. When you were growing up, did you go with him on location often? Not very often. Back then, it wasn't. You know, the actors could bring their kids, but stunt guys didn't really bring their kids on location like they do now. I know you doubled your dad in a scene in The Gray Fox that was shot up in Canada. Canada, right. Can you uh, tell us, share some memories well, about the, that? The one shot I doubled him in, I did some fall down some rocks. I mean, big, big rocks. And uh, they looked at the footage and said, well, shit, that killed him. So they didn't put it in the show. But I, but I did do some horseback riding stuff for him with the train. And well, there is that sequence in The Gray Fox where the train comes and your dad is on that horse right by the tracks, and that and horse that's all him. spooks. Oh, yeah, you could see it. That's him. all him, yeah. That was... I just did the long shots of riding stuff. Well, I think that when the horse spooked, that was the most action in that movie, though. Besides fall down the box <laughs> that they didn't <laughs> use. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to hear about it, though. Well, Monty, in your film debut, The Hour of the Gun, how did that come about? How did you get that part? No, I was just very fortunate. Um, I had just come into town in 65, and uh, they had a, a season at the uh, Pasadena Playhouse. They were going to hire 10 actors for about eight shows, and I went in and auditioned. And uh, they, we finished in March, and my, see, Rudy Ramos, I finally got to meet him and talk to him, but my great friend, one of the actors was uh, Henry uh, Delgado, uh, Lee uh, Delgado, now he's uh, Henry Darrow, and uh, uh, Stuart Margolin, and uh, we all three got jobs, and I had gone in and uh, uh, met the producer, and um, John Sturgis, and uh, 
Lynn Stallmaster cast me, and next thing I know, I was on the plane down to um, Torreon, and it was uh, my first film and first feature, and it was just, uh, well, you can imagine. Um, I'd been in theater for 15 years and come back, and I'm 31 or two or something, and uh, to walk on the set, and there's uh, Robert Ryan, Jimmy Garner, Jason Robards, <laughs> Johnny Voigt's first film, uh, Sam Melville, Frank Converse, and then all these terrific actors from uh, New York playing the characters, and it was great. Wyatt Earp lived through the gunfight at the OK Corral. That may have been a mistake. You're under arrest. For what? Murder. Leroy Johnson doubled me. Uh, it was great. That was it. Well, uh, didn't Leroy Johnson uh, comment something? Uh, he was asked who was the best horseman? Let me tell you that. Oh, please. I was watching the, uh, the Cowboys, which I thought was just phenomenal. Leroy, uh, we were talking about uh, different people, different writers, and I had mentioned uh, Cowboys and how good Wayne was. And he looked at me and he laughed a bit and he thought, he said we were doing the Alamo and the reporters were all interviewing John Wayne, interviewing him and finally said, who's the, uh, who's the best Hollywood actor who can ride? And without missing a beat, Leroy was riding by and he said, Joe McRae. <laughs> great, great story. Well, Rudy, so uh, your entrance into films, you got an early break in the, the popular series High Chaparral. How did, how did you get that part? Well, I, I auditioned for it. Um, they, I, I auditioned, went in one morning to see the casting director, Milt Hammerman, and um, he, liked, he liked my read, so he brought me to Warner Brothers way deep in Warner Brothers to Mr. David Dortort's office in the afternoon. And they had been looking for this character, uh, trying to cast this character for quite a while. Uh, they just couldn't find the right, what Mr. Dortort was looking for. So uh, I, I did a read in the afternoon for Mr. Dortort and uh, there, was some <laughs> there was some crazy stuff that happened in that office. But uh, long story short, I, I, I finished my audition and, and I got to the door and I had my hand on the handle, and I, 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 just, I just stopped. And I said, I turned around, and I looked at Mr. Dortort and the producer, whoever he was, and I said, would you mind if we did that again? And that's just, you know, I had no credits. It just didn't feel right. I had training, but I had no credits. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, do it again. So we did it again, and it happened. I mean, it, it happened, but we changed parts. I said, could you... Could I do your part and you do my part? And it was something from a hat full of rain. It wasn't a, a, t a movie script, a TV script. It wasn't anything to do with my character. It was just when we did that, it happened. And I sat down and I was thinking, boy, I shouldn't have done that. And uh, Mr. Dortart was just smiling. He said, how, how soon can you get to Tucson, Arizona? And there it was. So that was my first job. And you know, nice. uh, it, it was, uh, I, I started on the world stage in a, in, a, in a legendary Western, now legendary Western, and I'm near the end of my career uh, in another legendary Western, Yellowstone. So, doesn't get any better than that. Thank you. Well, before we get to Darby, let me ask you about Yellowstone then, too, because it is quite an arc from your character on High Chaparral, and you, you had a few lean years, as is want in the business. It's a lot of hills and valleys, people, and, and you, you're, you're in for the long haul, as Rudy has been, and he's in a number one series that has revolutionized uh, television right now because everybody says, gosh, maybe we should be making westerns, and they are. So, yeah. so, so thank you for that, Rudy. So how did, how did the part in Yellowstone, how'd you get that? Well, uh, number one, I, I, I was not doing any film during not doing any film, but I was, I was working. I, I'm always working. I, I do stage, too. So I was traveling around the country for six years with a one-man show called Geronimo Life on the Reservation, and it's Geronimo's side. And it's a one-hour show that got rave reviews all over the country, and uh, uh, I was honored to be able to give him a voice that he never had. Even though my people and I are afraid of what might happen to us, I know it is the right thing to do. 
Uh, but the last show was uh, the uh, final performance of the solo festival of 2020 at the White Fire Theater in uh, uh, Sherman Oaks, Oklahoma. And uh, Oklahoma, that's where I'm from. Sherman Oaks, California. <laughs> and it's early in the morning for me. Uh, they, they, they live streamed it with no audience. And it probably turned out to be the most powerful performance I did in, in the six-year period because there was no audience. There was just a camera right in front of me, and I got real intimate with it, even more intimate. It, that, that's my baby. That's what I was doing the last six, six um, years. And then when I got the audition for Yellowstone, I figured I was maybe number three on the list. I thought maybe Wes Studi would get it. I thought uh, Graham Greene possibly could get it. They're both Academy Award nominees, and then there's me. So I didn't even bother myself with that. I just went in, uh, did my reading, and on my way home, my agent called me and said, they'd like to see you again uh, in about 10 days. So 10 days later, I have 10 days deeper into those two scenes, and I went in and I read it, and. Uh, I heard somebody say, yep, that's it. <laughs> and I didn't see, there was more, there was more people in that office than is here right now. And when you go into an audition and there's that many people in the, uh, you know, in the office, I, and I didn't really know anything about the project. I didn't know anything about the character other than those two scenes. So I just brought what I thought it should have. And, um, there was it, the person that said, "Yep, that's it." When I left the office, I found out later that it was Taylor Sheridan, but he wasn't in the office. He was watching it on Skype in Utah. <laughs> so, uh, boy, on my way home again, my agent called me and said they want to they want to book you for the first two shows. And I thought, "But well, God, that's great. That's great." Well, two shows turned into seven in season one, and one season has turned into five. <laughs> so they just keep bringing me back. I don't know why, but they do. So. I'm still, I'm still standing. A great part. Yeah, it is a great part. Yeah, it's a real nice part. So I'm very happy to do it. I play Felix Long, Monica's, if you watch the show, Monica's grandfather. So they bring me back here and there and just, I think because of, of establishing that character in season one, when they bring you back again, they know who you are. The audience knows who you are. And if they don't, they've probably gone back and watched season one, two, and three, because it's all live streamed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not like, who's that? What, 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 what? It's, it's, it, the characters have been established. So they bring me back, and I, I, I will keep coming back as long as they bring me back. And that's a good thing to do. That's a good thing to do. <laughs> yep, yep. And Kevin Costner is a, an angel among us. He's one of the nicest people I've ever met in show business, just so everyone knows, because most people like him, but every once in a while there's that one that, well, I don't like him. Well, why? Well, I don't know, I just don't. You know, we were talking about Diamond's father, Dick. Darby, his father had been an actor that hung out with some top guys and, and he, he passed a little too soon, but I'd like for you to share some stories about your dad. He, uh, Errol Flynn and Tyrone Power were like the three amigos in Hollywood. They all hung out together. They all died within a year of each other too and uh, all young and so that was kind of, but that's how I got my start if we're all talking about how we got the start. Um, I had a couple older sisters and they started doing commercials when they were young and stuff. And then my dad finally had me and people would ask him, well, you know, what about your boy? Is he going to go in the business? I don't know. The kid's a bum. He's two months old, hasn't earned a dime, you know. And he's three months old, hasn't earned a dime, and he loved telling that joke, and it drove my mom crazy. So at six months old, she managed to get me on Playhouse 90. Didn't tell him, but just, oh, yeah, we got somebody you're going to want to watch on this show. So he sat there and watched the whole thing, and then when it was over, he just turned to her and goes, Marilyn? You sure know how to ruin a good joke. <laughs> but that's how I kind of got started in it, and then I kept doing commercials and, and working after that. So it was a good thing. And then unfortunately, like you said, he died when I was just a little over a year old. And my mom was like, well, you know, this business will, will put a lot of male influence in his life. Because she was a single mom. I just had two older sisters. And, you know, she wanted to make sure I grew up rough and tough and stuff. So... So she kept me in the business. Uh, I did some great things. Uh, I had a little, uh, I'd say, interve intervention, whatever it was from above, 
walked into the wrong uh, casting office when I was supposed to be running in to go try out for Sound of Music. And you were how old? How old at this time? I was five at this time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, my mom came and said, come on, they're casting Sound of Music. It's going to be this big movie and all. So she put me in lederhosen, knee-high socks. <laughs> And from the top of Bel Air Road where we live, down to 20th Century Fox, had me singing Edelweiss and Doe a Deer. <laughs> but uh, she was always late to everything, and she even managed to be late to her own funeral, but that was just her running late. So we pulled into the 20th Century Fox lot, pulled up in front of the three-story casting building, and she said, go in, run in, you know, get in line, I'm gonna park the car, I'll come get you. And I ran in, and I saw a line of kids, so I got in that line. And the secretary just kind of looked out at me and goes, come here. And I go, what's your name? I'm Darby Hinton. Just wait right here one minute. And she took me, as soon as the other kid came out, in front of everybody else, she took me into the office. I'm sure just to give him a little comic relief that, you know, this, this guy was here in lederhosen and knee-high socks. And it was, once again, a room full of people, not quite that many, but, you know, a lot of big people, big desk, everything. And I had, had just done a wagon train. And halfway through shooting wagon train, I lost my front tooth. So they had to give me a flapper to, to put in so that they, you know, didn't have to go back and reshoot everything, and it matched. And I remember one of the things I said to them was, well, look, if you like me, you can have me this way. And I ducked underneath the table, pulled out my tooth, or you can have me this way. <laughs> and they all cracked up, especially the big guy. He loved it. He was calming me down. All right, great. So I, I left there, walked out into the hall, and my mom was running up and down the hall saying, there you are. Where have you been? They've been waiting for you upstairs. I can't believe the way. I said, I, I don't know, Mom, but whatever's in there, I just got it. <laughs> And that was Israel Boone on Daniel Boone. And the tall guy was? Vess Parker. Vess Parker. And actually, it wasn't even, I didn't even get Israel Boone. They wrote a part in for me as Nathan Boone, one of the other kids, because this was all the callbacks, the final callbacks. One of the kids got Israel Boone. But then during the shooting of the pilot, we had a, a great old director, George Marshall, who, um, I don't know why, because he used to use the old... You know, it wasn't an electric megaphone, but he'd have that big cone yelling at people and, you know, the highest chair and the director's director. But I gravitated towards him and I would sit on his lap while he was directing. And he wrote a scene in for me where I pull out a flaming arrow and do the whole. And they saw it in dailies and said, well, why do we need the older kid? Let's make him Israel. So they only had to reshoot one shot where Becky ran up and called me Nathan so she could run up and call me Israel. But right then and there, they got rid of the other kid and... Made me Israel. <laughs> so, so uh, question, in, in that first episode, <laughs> what happened to the kid? Was he still seen in that first episode? If, if you watch the first one, Kentucky was the pilot. When Daniel comes home, two boys run out from the woods to kind of greet him. And then at the very end, when they leave the tag shot, we're leaving the fort, and Boone walks out with his family, You'll see we're all holding hands, and on either side, there's two young boys. But, you know, they never explained it or anything. They just, that's what it was. Now, Daniel liked women, so he wanted to have a big family. Is that what it was? Well, the real Daniel had 11 kids. Whoa. And I've been to the Boone cabin, and I don't know how in that small cabin with that many kids, he managed to get more kids. So that was, that was a treat or a, a feat, I should say. Well, your your mom certainly had the right idea by surrounding you with men, and you got very lucky. Well, well they got lucky to get you too, but lucky. I couldn't have gotten better. I couldn't have gotten a better surrogate dad for six years, and we stayed friends all the way up to the very end. At, than Fess Parker, he's just a, a wonderful guy. Like so many of the westerns that that we all seem to have grown up watching in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s because of the proliferation of all of these channels, these digital channels and cable channels, they're discovering that, golly, there's an audience out there that just loves westerns and they'll watch them over and over and over again. And so it'll be, the gun smoke will be running on get TV for a while, then it'll switch over to grit TV, and now it's running like 10 hours a day on INSP TV. So uh, it's, it's great that the Westerns have an audience. That audience is graying as we are, 
but uh, we're. What are you talking about? <laughs> so I would like to thank all of you for coming today and being in the heat. And uh, Diamond, thank you. Monty, thank you. Rudy, Darby, thank you all for being a part of this and Pleasure. sharing thank your you memories. All.